Welcome to everyone. I will warn you, I'm going to speak very quickly today like I'm on a debate team because we have a lot to cover in 50 minutes. So if I'm going too quickly, don't be afraid to say slow down a little. But I want to make sure we make it through everything. We only have an hour to kind of get in prep to get into your class. Can some of you just yell out what different colleges or majors you will be teaching in? So I get a sense of who's in this room. Theater, kinesiology, geology, engineering, political science, chemistry, economics, art history, geography, geology, gender and race studies, excellent, chemistry, history, and leadership. Okay, so from all over the college, engineering, engineers in here? No engineers in here this time? One, okay, math, biology, okay, so, okay, so the sciences. So I think we're pretty well covered. Any nursing? Okay, so pretty well covered. So today we're going to talk about, as you know, syllabus um, creation and course preparation. How many of you have taught at some level before, elementary through college? Oh good, so about 30 of you probably have some experience. How many of you have no experience whatsoever and you're just jumping in? Both feet. Okay, excellent. Well, hopefully, as I'm speaking very quickly, at the end of today's session, you will know how to create a syllabus here at the University of Alabama because it is different from other places. You know the key components of the syllabus, understand the importance of planning and preparation, and then hopefully be a little bit more confident about being a good GTA, finding out who you are. Now, if you are in race and gender studies or sociology or like being in college communication or in psychology, you've probably heard of Irving Goffman. And Irving Goffman tells us that we each have a self that arises from our interactions with other people and that we're constantly managing those expressions. And when you are teaching, that is precisely what you are doing. You are managing your impressions with others. So I just told you on Carol Mills, um, I am an associate professor in communication studies in the College of Communication. If I had said I am Carol Mills and I am an associate professor in biology, would any of you know any different? You wouldn't have. You will only know what I tell you. If I started this session by taking off my shoes, So dudes, today we're going to talk about solution trees. You wouldn't have known that that's not how I normally teach. That's who you would have thought I was. You'd have been going, whoa, they asked her to do this. Why? And Gotham talked about the fact that our impressions with others are things that are mostly within our control. There's some social and cultural and race and gender boundaries. But we do have a lot of control over how people see us. And what I want to emphasize to you is you have the ability to manage your impressions with the students that you are going to have. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yes. I can't tell this not okay. You're going to have the ability to manage your impressions with your students from that very first day. Can all of you think about one of your favorite professors and perhaps the reason you do what you do? You can think about that first. Can you think about the professors and the instructors you had and you thought, oh, dear God, get me out of this class. It was the torturous experience of my life. You can't. You want to be more like the former than the latter. But can you become the former? You can't. That's not who you are. My favorite professor in my life was a guy named Francis Skin. He was an English professor at the University of Miami. And it was the late 80s, early 90s, and I was an 18-year-old who was madly in love with him. He was 80. He was like Paul Newman, and he always wore like these awesome Z Cavariccis and Hugo Boss clothes, which were the bomb in the 80s and 90s, which was before some of you were born. And he wore white box, and he polished them with an eraser when he came to class. And he lived on the yacht, and he raced cars on weekends, and he was married to a 22-year-old and a 3-year-old son. <laughs> but he was like Paul Newman. It didn't seem creepy. The dude was awesome. And when he taught, he was brilliant. And you hung on every single word he said. 
And I still use some of his examples when I'm teaching, especially that how long should a paper be. I, I go back to the Frank Skip example, which I can't do because it would take me 10 minutes. But in a nutshell, somebody would say, how long would a paper be? And he goes, whatever class we were in. Like, you know, it was American literature of the C, which was my first class of him, or literature of the C. He goes, well, we did. 500 paper class of paper. And he'd go back to doing whatever he was doing. <laughs> and then a minute later, he'd go, but you know, the Ten Commandments? And then that would be the answer to his question, and then he'd go on. And he would do whatever he was going to do. Right? So whenever my students ask me that question, right, I loved him. Am I ever going to be him? No. Right? But I can take the things I learned from him, and I can try to apply them to who I am. He wasn't goofy. I know I'm kind of goofy. Whatever I do, it's got to embrace my goofy nature. If I try to be serious all the time, it wouldn't work. Right? But I can embrace that and try to figure out how that works within the rest of my teaching style, taking the lessons from him. But the three most important things that any good professor does, any good instructor does, or has, is knowledge, they are fair, and they are organized. I have had plenty of professors that I learned a ton from that weren't necessarily my favorite professors, but they might have been the best classes I ever had. I have a racing gender studies person in here. I had a class in feminist literary criticism. Right? Her name was Sherry Bedstock, and she was serious, and she scared me, and I constantly got C's from her, and it's my only C in college. But looking back, if I hadn't had that class, I would have never been prepared for doctoral work. She was rigorous. She was fair. She destroyed my writing repeatedly, and I learned a ton from her. And here's the thing is I didn't like her, but I respected her, and I learned a ton from her. And so when you think about who you want to present to your students, the one thing I want to get all of you to get out of your head as much as you can is you don't want to be popular. This is not a popularity contest. Your teaching evaluations are not likes on Facebook. You want your students to learn something from you. You want them to walk away, if you're teaching a basic German class, prepared to go in the next class. Because if you're teaching the first German class, and you know, you've got somebody who's teaching the second class, and all your students don't know the basics, who does that reflect poorly on? You. Right? So you may be really popular, they may have given you great evaluations, but if they walk into the next class in the sequence and they haven't learned anything, you have failed in your job. So knowledge is important. Now here's the reality. How many of you are teaching a class that you never even had as an undergrad? What are you teaching? You're teaching anatomy. You didn't even take it. Okay. What about you? Oh, okay. So you're teaching like the Mass Column 101 class or something or one of the journalism. Okay. So a journalism class. Right? So you guys might be teaching a class you never even had as an undergrad. How are you going to have knowledge? Prepare. Prepare. Don't be reading the chapter the night before they read it, or even worse. Have you ever had professors that didn't even read the darn book that they assigned? Don't be that person. Take the time to read the materials ahead of time and do additional work to make sure you know at least as much as they do, if not more, before you walk into that classroom. And if they ask you a question you don't know the answer to, what do you say? Yeah, that's a great question. I will get back to you on that because I don't want to mislead you. Right? Or, you know, if it's an area in which there's research controversy, you go, wow, you know what, I've heard, you know, the research has said a few different things. Let me see what the prevailing opinion currently is on that. Or, hey, why don't we look that up together? You know, that's a great opportunity for them to come to your office and look it up together. And they're never going to go, oh, he didn't know that because he told me he'd look it up with me. They go, wow, that's really cool. The professor invited me to come figure that out with him. So if I cared enough to answer, ask the question, well, the instructor actually cared enough to help me find the answer. Score. Don't make things up. Now, in this hall of knowledge, the most important thing you can do is establish your credibility that very first day. How many of you are master's students or first-year doctoral students? Do you tell them that? No. I, if you don't have to tell them for any reason, don't. 
because this university is filled with assistant professors, associate professors, adjuncts, instructors, lecturers, graduate students, and if you don't tell them you're a graduate student, they don't know. Now, why do I say especially those of you who are really young, you probably don't want to draw attention to that? They'll think of you as one of them. And so what I want you to do is I want you to write down three things that you can tell them about yourself that would help you establish your credibility to them the first day without you saying I'm a graduate student. I want you to write down three things that you're bringing to that class that help you establish your credibility. Rather than detracts from it. Right? So establish your persona and knowledge. 
And then, like I said, make sure you know more than they do and say don't. If you don't, have them help you work through it. Fairness. How many of you have ever had a class where you felt like the teacher was showing favoritism? Isn't that an awful feeling? <coughs> and yet, we all do it inadvertently. Right? You need to make sure that you are fair with all of your students. If you have a policy that says late work will be deducted one letter grade per day, and what is your name? And Cassidy comes to you and says, oh, my computer broke, and I'm so sorry I tried to print it right before class, or you know, the reading room was full and I couldn't print it. And you say, okay, fine, you turn it into me by the end of today, it's not a penalty. What's the problem with that? Yeah, and it's showing favoritism. A student can say, wait a minute, you know what, she should have been printing out five minutes before class, right? Because maybe she's still working on it for the next hour. You have no way of knowing that. And so now you disadvantage the other 35, 45, or 250 students in your class by allowing that person to turn it in late without a penalty. And here's the problem, is all of us want to go, well, we know what it's like. We don't want to seem like we're being harsh and unfair. But by, showing faith, by, by allowing one student an advantage, you're not giving everyone else. You're being unfair to everyone else. So really think about that. And when you talk about the late penalty, you can give those kinds of examples the first day. Of, I know some of you are going to think if it's only 20 minutes late, it shouldn't count. But I need to be respectful of everybody who does get it done on time and prepared. And if it's something that deserves a real excuse, you got in a car accident, you have the flu, a parent died, that's different, right? But you need to have that as we'll talk about in your policy statement. But be as careful of not seeming unfair, right? Or chumming up with particular students. You know, if you had, if you did your undergrad degree here and was recently, and you know people in your class, be very careful of not making it clear that you guys are friends. And especially for those of you who recently graduated, and I know that this seems really unfair and really harsh. Go to the alcove or someplace where graduate students hang out, not the hound student. <laughs> it is, and I know that that's hard, but hanging out and drinking where your undergrad drink can decrease your credibility. And you think they don't notice and they don't talk, but trust me, they do. And my students will tell me, like, oh my gosh, there was this, you know, engineering GTA and he was drunk and died. I saw. They talk, and if that stuff gets back to your advisors and your chairs, that doesn't reflect well on you professionally. And it's hard because this, is, this might be your home and the places you like to go. But you know, the alcove and other, there are places where graduate students go and hang out and faculty members go and hang out. You need to seek out those kinds of places, okay? I know a couple of you are going, is she serious? I really am. Um, and above all, be organized. How many of you have ever had an instructor or faculty member that lost your papers, that took weeks to grade things, that seemed so scattered that they'd come to class and couldn't find their own lecture notes, they would always have the excuse that they put it up on Blackboard but somehow it just didn't show up? Have you ever had one of those? Don't be that person. Right? There are some things you won't be able to control. Life is going to happen, but be as organized as you possibly can. Because it doesn't matter if you're the most popular, but because if you are the most disorganized, no matter how much they say he was cool, they will also say he was a scattergrade. Right? You don't want to decrease your credibility. So the syllabus helps you stay organized. So let's now talk about what a good syllabus is. A good syllabus provides a vision and rationale for the class. It also kind of provides a rationale for the logic and the organization of the class. If you are teaching your first class on your own, is it a new class that nobody at this university has ever taught before? Yeah, most of these classes have been taught before by somebody. They're probably not going to give you a new prep for a new class that's never, ever been offered. Right? Now, if you're Rick Bragg, who's in our college, a Pulitzer Prize winner, the first time you teach, they might give you a class that nobody's ever taught. Most of us are not Pulitzer Prize winners. We are teaching things that have been taught for years by other people. Can you see other people's syllabi? Yes. How? You can ask them if they were willing to share their syllabus. And you should. And you can also go on my Bama and click on the class schedule and see syllabi for the last three or four years from those classes. Should you simply cut and paste somebody else's syllabus without their permission? 
No, that would be academic misconduct. But if you say, may I please use your syllabus, and you have permission, then it's entirely okay to do so. But even when I'm creating my new prep for a persuasion doctoral seminar, I ask four or five of my friends who teach this class other places, like, hey, can I see how you've done this class? And I'm taking bits and pieces from each of them to figure out what will best meet my needs and my students' needs. Okay? But you have to have a vision for a rationale for this class and a logic and organization. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. You can even Google other so on. And you need to know from the outset what you want from the class. So you're teaching anatomy, right? What do you want the students to know? What is the organization of the class? How many of you have ever had a class, and my guess is most of your classes, where you think the organization of the class is we did the first chapter in the textbook, then we did the second chapter in the textbook, and then we did the third chapter in the textbook, and that was the class organization. Is that actually a class organization? No, that's a textbook structure. You need to be thinking to yourself, what clusters of information are my students going to learn? How are we going to move through this material? So even if you plan on doing chapters 1 through 12 in the textbook, think to yourself, what does that mean? Are we moving from the micro to the macro? Are we looking at the internal you know, functions and then the external functions? Are we going to go through grammar and then syntax and then blank? Are we going to go through increasing progression of difficult language? Are we going to do set design and then lighting and then this and then that? Think about what that organization is so that you have a sense of how to do it. That is your roadmap. How many of you use GPS when you go from place to place? Most of us, right? But how many of you put it on and then kind of get a preview and you look at where you're going to go and then you listen to the turn by turn directions, but first you look and see where it's going to take you? Right? Why do we do that? Right, so we don't get lost, and if it cuts out, we'll know that maybe something happened and we went too far. It's the same thing with your syllabus. Right? Think about what that logic and organization is. And then, remember I talked about organization? If you do upfront work in your syllabus, it will save you so much work in the future. If you provide students with a clear set of ex uh, expectations for assignments, in your syllabus. Not just you're going to have a 10-page paper at the end of the semester. Not just we're going to have a midterm and a final. But you're going to have a 10-page paper. Here are all the requirements. This is the style you're expected to use. And even here's a rubric to grade if you use rubrics. Um, and you know, we're going to have an exam. It's going to be 50 questions, 25 multiple choice, 10 true false, blah, blah, blah. Then students know what to expect. And if they know what to expect, what do they do less of? Ask questions. And we want students to ask questions, but if we have to answer the same question 30 times, that's a waste of our time. If we put everything in the syllabus up front, then it's nice and organized, and they, it reduces their anxiety tremendously. How many of you have used rubrics in the past? Some of you. How many of you have no idea what a rubric is? At least you all know what the one person is not. A rubric is kind of almost like a little checklist of what a paper or assignment requires. So like for a paper, it might say like good organization, like you get 10 points if your organization is clear, you have a thesis statement and transitions. Four organizations, I can't follow no transitions. You know, number of spelling errors is number of points. You know, content uses sources appropriately to does not source. And then students can see exactly what you're going to be grading them on ahead of time. Because when a teacher or professor says, hey, you're going to have a 10-page paper, what's your first question? How am I going to get graded on it? Right? It's all about style. Does he care about spelling? Does he care about format? Does he care about content? So spell those things out front in the syllabus. And give a schedule. But make sure your schedule says tentative daily schedule. Always give yourself an opportunity to change things if they need to be changed. Because you should always have a teaching buddy. The university frowns on you canceling class. But sometimes things do happen at the last minute. Your car breaks down, you get the flu, you can't find someone to cover. I'll be honest, I always tell my students now, 
you know, before, you know, make sure you check Blackboard if it's really severe weather, because we may do class online that day. Because I live in Birmingham, and after April 27th, if there's even potential for tornadoes, I'm probably not going to drive in. And after snow again, when I got stuck here and got hit walking home, you know, driving home, because some idiot wanted to go 60 miles an hour in a pickup truck, on snowy roads in Alabama, right? If there's severe weather, I'm going to do class online. And so I tell my students how we use e-learning for online classes or Blackboard Learn from the very beginning, right? And so I rarely have to cancel classes, even if I'm sick, they don't have to see me, and I can do a voiceover or recorded lecture online. So have those backup plans and let students know what they are. Your syllabus should also define and discuss your mutual responsibilities. We had a faculty member in our college that had on her syllabus, if you turn in a paper with a staple rather than a paper clip, you lose one full letter grade. How many students do you think complained about that? A lot of students. Did she have every right to do that? She did. Right? She had every right to do that. It was in her syllabus. It was one of her expectations. Now, most of us can roll our eyes and go, okay, that's kind of a ridiculous one. But it was in her syllabus, and the students knew what the expectations were. And when they went to the department chair to complain, the department chair said, well, can you please show me your syllabus? Well, it's on there. Well, then why didn't you do it? Because I didn't think she was serious. <laughs> well, that was your choice. Right? You chose to ignore something that was on the syllabus. The syllabus is the contract. So if you have particular requirements, they need to be on there. But you should also let them know what your responsibilities are to them. And this includes things like, and I include this and you don't have to, but it also helps me go back to the organized thing. I tell them how long it will be before I turn back exams and papers. I would tell them you will get all exams and papers back within two weeks of when you turn them in. And if it's a small class, maybe one week. But if I say, you will get them back two weeks from the date you turn them in. What do they know? Right, when they're going to get them back, which means what am I not going to get? Yeah, a thousand emails saying, when are we going to get our papers back? When are we going to get our papers back? When are we going to get our papers back? And if I get 30 of those emails, what do I have to do? Answer each and every one of them. What does that take from me? Time. And one sentence on my syllabus eliminates that possibility. Okay, so being organized up front and putting that stuff in there helps. Tell students how you want to contact you. I told them, don't ever call my office, period. I don't have a machine in there. And when I'm doing research, I don't answer the phone. If you want me, email me. And if it's a huge class, I will tell them, I will always respond to your emails in 48 hours. If you do not hear back from me in 48 hours, feel free to send a second email. If it's small class, I say I will always respond within 24 hours. If you don't feel, you know, if I don't get back to you, feel free to send me a second email. If I don't do that, what happens? I get emails asking if they got their emails within an hour or two. Within an hour or two. You live in an era now where students send it and they expect me to respond like it's a text message. If I'm in the middle of a research project or I am in meetings, where my, my kids' lacrosse games or football games or basketball games or karate or all the other stupid activities I have that three children manage to you know, suck my life up with, I am not going to be sitting at one of their activities responding to student emails. Okay? But if I say I will be back to you in 24 or 48 hours and then you can re-email me, they go, oh, okay, she's not ignoring me. I know what to expect. And they appreciate knowing that up front. Now, some of you might give your cell phone number out. I don't advise it because they will use it, but you know, however you want them to contact you, let them know. And they're great about it as long as they know. Okay? And if you have a really good set of activities and policies and schedule ahead of time with everything laid out, it allows the students who really are self-motivated a very high degree of personal control over their learning. And there is nothing I love more than I go over the syllabus, you know, there's a case study due at the end of the semester, and the first week, a student comes to my office and says, hey, Dr. Mills, I know it's not due for three months, but can we talk about this case study? Yes, we can. I love you. And can I just give you an A right now? <laughs> right? Because the students who know that they've got a plan will plan. Now, does that mean you won't have students that call you, you know, an hour ahead of time, you know, oh, we had a paper due today? They're still going to do that. But it gives them that high degree of personal control. So try to have stuff spelled out as much as you possibly can. 
So let's look at the UA Solar's requirements. And you've got all of these on the handouts, but it's much more effective for me to actually show them to you online. Oh, where did they go here? Okay. Let me log back in because I think it's logged me out. Okay. So if you go to my Bama, have all of you seen the online syllabus tool? Have any of you not? Okay. So if you log on to my Bama, oops, hold on. And if you want to pull out your devices and follow along, you're welcome to. And actually, that's something else you guys all need to think about. What is your policy for devices in class? Right? And you want to spell that out. I'll be honest with you, I am pro-device in class. Quite frankly, if my students want to text while I'm talking, Darwin, at work, yay, I don't have to worry about a normal curve because they just took care of it for me. As long as it's not distracting, I don't care if you want to text the whole class. Your loss, not mine, why do I care? You know, and I know faculty members who freak out when people have their cell phones out in class. I'm like, um, I was just in a faculty meeting with you and you never put yours down. <laughs> so, like, why on earth are you... Now, I would advise you not to be teaching and getting on your cell phone. That's rude. Um, but, you know, if you really don't like it, I have some people that can't teach because it gets really distracting for them if people are on their cell phones. Right? Um, I did have a student in my 101 class who insisted on wearing the big over-the-ear headphones. And I did have to say to that student, I would appreciate it if you take off those big headphones or not come to class at all. Because that was just clearly like a 16-year-old move of, you know, F you, I'm not listening. You know, that, that was a little over the top. Right? Um, but if they use a laptop and you would ask them not to, you can nicely say, hey, you need to put, you know, I'd appreciate it if you put that away. Do not ever touch their personal property. Don't ever close on them and say, I told you you can't. Like if I came over and said, I told you you couldn't use this, and I put it down, the student, the student could potentially have charges against you and break, you know, they, they broke the computer, whatever. So don't touch their stuff. But you can ask them to put it away, but decide ahead of time what your policy is. And if your policy is different from anybody else's, even though I don't care about devices, they'll say, well, Dr. So-and-so won't let me use my uncle. Well, yeah, that's because he's uptight and old. <laughs> all of us are allowed to have different policies. Mine is different. That's all you have to say. Okay? So, um, Blackboard, you log, I mean, you log into um, my Bama, then you go to the faculty tab. Okay? Then all the way over on the right, you see this thing that says OIRA resources. Can all of you see that? Make it a little bit better. OIRA resources. You click on this. If you are teaching a class, even if your department forgets to tell you this, it is a university regulation that you have to put your syllabus on here. If you are responsible for a class, you are responsible by university policy for putting your, your syllabus on the system. Because when SACS, which is a regional accrediting agency, comes in to look, they want 100% compliance of all syllabi being on here. Okay? And it actually makes your life a whole lot easier because every semester you can use the same one if you choose to, to change the dates of assignments, etc. So you go to OIRA resources and you click on syllabus management. Then you click on manage. So last semester I taught relational communication. And you can see my syllabus here. And I'll tell you it was already published. Okay? But the university automatically has all of these headings office hours and contact information. Okay? Prerequisites. The catalog course description. Then it says student learning outcomes, and you put your own student learning outcomes on there. And this is where I'm saying you really need to think about what do you want to say in your class. And we'll talk about this in a moment. What are the most important things for your students to know? Those are what go into student learning outcomes. Okay? The required text. If a text has been ordered by the bookstore, it automatically puts it in there. It automatically populates it. If you want to add other course material, you can do that. Then it asks for an outline of topics. Okay. Then your exams and assignments. And as you can see, I am very detailed here. I say this blog assignment was designed to blank. Here's everything you have to do. And then I tell them exactly how it's going to be graded. It'll be graded on how well the paper addresses and defines the topic, the depth, the quality, the clarity, proper use of APA style, 
grammar, spelling, and argumentation. Here are the journals you're allowed to use. Here's how you do a search, how long it has to be. I tell them every single thing they need to know about that assignment. Why? I'm sorry? Exactly. Fewer questions, and it gives them a sense of relief. They know what to do. They know how it's going to be graded. And they feel like I actually know what I'm talking about because I know what my expectations are. And then for the literature review and final paper, I even give them a basic grading rubric. And you know, somebody said they had never seen one. It looks like this. The topic research based on the topic is not clearly defined. Do both arguments, both sides of the argument are thoroughly researched. Right? So they know if they want to do an exceptional job, they have to show me both sides of the research. They see it right there on the rubric. So if they get a poor grade, they can go, oh, it's because blank. Okay? Grammar, less than two spelling or grammatical errors. I have quantified it for that. So they know they have to proofread. And if they do a fantastic paper, but there are more than four spelling errors, they know they're losing 15 points right off the top. They can't say, well, I didn't know you were counting it that much. Well, I had told you ahead of time. Okay, exactly everything I'm looking for. Um, and then my grading policy, okay, um, you know, and how is what the grading scale is. Okay. And you can see I'm one of those horrible people that says I don't A pluses will be at the sole discretion of the professor and will not be awarded if you have more than two absences. I purposely don't tie A pluses to grade only because every once in a while I have the students that does not contribute at all in classroom picks, but on the assignment, someone said he didn't help the rest of the class in any way. A pluses for, you know. So I have my policy that the university says we can offer eight pluses. Does it say I have to give one? No. As long as your policy is clear, you are covered. But you need to tell students what that policy is. Okay? Um, and then um, one of the things that always surprises people that I think is incredibly important to do is I have this grade three evaluation policy. And I added this. This is not a university requirement. But I say, if you think that a grade should be reviewed, you may request in writing that the paper be regraded. To do this, you must submit to me the original paper and a memo requesting the regrade. And I'll get it back to you within a week. Right? Why do I have a policy that tells me about regrades? Yeah, because here's the thing is, have you ever had a student that thought they got an unfair grade? Have you ever been a student that thought you had an unfair grade? Of course. Right? So rather than having the student just mad at me because they don't like the grade I gave him or her, right? they now have an avenue to ask for a regrade. Honestly, it prevents a lot of them coming up to me going, you gave me a C, and I really deserve an A. Right? And I can say, that's wonderful if you'd like to submit an option for regrade to me and tell me why you would like me you know, to regrade and what you think I missed. I'm happy to do that. And quite frankly, once they write out the reasons that they think the grade needs to be different, and they go back and look at the rubric. Sometimes I'll go, oh, crud. Yeah, you were right. And other times, they'll go, I think you missed this. And I'll go, you know what? I did. Because sometimes when we're grading, we do miss stuff. And we're too harsh. And if a student wants to take the time to point that out to me, I'm going to listen. Because I know I'm not perfect. Right? So I bet at that. Then I've got my policy on missed exams and coursework. It is incredibly important that you have one of these. Okay? Um, you know, it, just, it basically says, you know, all late work is not 10% of the day. You guys can make up your own. Um, it has to be an excuse or legitimate, uh, legitimate illness, right? And the decisions will be at my discretion. I let them know that up front. <coughs> and again, you just have to be fair in keeping that up. Then whatever your attendance policy is, right? And then severe weather guidelines the university puts in. And I really want to get home on this disability statement. That's automatically going to be in there as well. I always try to remind my students who go out of my way to tell my students that they really should use their disability accommodations if they have them. This little bit doesn't have my additional statement. You should put an additional statement in there saying, I know many times your students are afraid to use their ODS accommodations, but I am more than happy to give you whatever accommodations you need. If you need a note taker, I will do this discreetly immediately. If you need extra time, please take it. And when I talk to them the first day of class, I say there's nothing worse than a student who's really bright that gets to the end of the semester and realizes they're going to go C or D, and they haven't used the extra time that has been deemed necessary. You would be amazed at the number of students who do 
not use their audience accommodations because they're afraid to come to you and say, I need these accommodations. There is a stigma associated with it for a lot of students, and they're hoping they can get by without using them. It doesn't do them any good, and it doesn't do you any good. So you know, try to encourage them to use them. And then your statement on academic misconduct. The university automatically populates it, but you are welcome to add to it. And if you don't mention it in the syllabus, you can add, you know, emphasize it the first day of class. And as I told the first group that was in here, this is one where I probably scare most of my students, and I'm happy to do that. And I tell them, you know, I teach relational family communication, so they all know about my kids anyway. But I tell them that I'm a pretty dedicated mom, and I will do anything for my children, but we have a couple of rules that are non-negotiable. The first one is, if my children ever drink and drive, even if it's only a block, they immediately will lose their car and I will never again, as long as I live, pay for their car insurance or anything related to a car. Not even a gallon of gas. And I continue it by telling them, and some of you are going, wow, she's real. Um, I continue by telling them, if you believe that love is unconditional, if you kill someone in a drinking and driving accident, you will see very quickly it is not. Because I will never sit in front of a jury and say, you were a really good kid and made a very bad choice. What I will say is, my child made a really stupid decision, and it resulted in taking someone else's life, and I will be with the family of the person you killed, advocating for the full penalty that you can get, because you made a selfish and stupid decision and you deserve to be punished. I don't mess around with my kids on that particular topic. The other one that I'm just as mean about as a mom is academic misconduct. I have told them if they get caught cheating for any reason in high school, I will not pay a dime or even buy a book for their college education. And if they get caught cheating in college, I will not pay another penny towards their education. If they respect themselves so little that they are willing to cheat for a grade, I will not participate in that process in any way, shape, or form. If you get a C or D or fail in class, that sucks. But you earned it. Take the hit and move on. Grades are not the end of the world. Straight A's never got anybody a job. Right? You know, it might make your parents really, we can brag about my kid who's a straight A student, but beyond that, what does it mean in the real world? We all know, right? It's a combination of grades and experience and test scores. And so don't give up your integrity for one class. Right? And after I say that, they all kind of look at me and they go, whoa, she's pretty serious. And then I provide them a turn it in link on Blackboard Learning. You guys all know what turn it in is, right? And I set it up so that it doesn't record their papers, because you know some go into the repository, others don't. And I say use it as many times as you possibly need. Put your papers through there as many times as you need to make sure there's no plagiarism in your papers. Use it as a teaching tool rather than just as a gotcha tool. Right? Like I don't want to get students, that's not my goal. So I'm gonna give them every opportunity ahead of time to not do that. Okay? But I'm very serious about that academic misconduct, and I hope you are too. Because talk about unfair, right? It kind of messes things up for everyone else. So if we go back, um, mine is populated, but you can see if I wanted to, I haven't done mine for this year yet, but let's say I say I'm going to create, um, oh, here it is. So my independent studies, I don't really have one. You'll see it puts in the blank template for you. It'll automatically put in the title that had all the things that we just talked about. And then you know you just have to fill it in. And the great thing is, like for this semester, I'm teaching relational communication, create, I can click on it, and then I can import everything from last semester into it and just change the dates if I want to. Now, I tend to change my classes up significantly every single semester, but you can change very easily. Also, once you have your syllabus, when you log into Blackboard Learn, you can immediately simply link the syllabus that's in OIRA to Blackboard Learn. So you don't have to cut and paste your syllabus, you don't have to upload it. You just say use the OIRA link and the system is smart and knows to use that syllabus right there in Blackboard Learn. So please log on, play with it. Once you get it all ready, you have to hit the publish button so that other people can see it. But you can always publish it, change it, publish it, change it, publish it, change it. Just make sure that you have a statement on there that says tentative 
and let students know that if you make any changes, you'll give them one week's notice or something like that. Any questions about the syllabus and the online system? Everyone think they got it? And I'll throw it at you. You think you got that part? Okay, so all that's all right. So, course prep. Before you even get to the syllabus, we only got five minutes left, you have to design your course. Ask yourself who your students are. Did you think you're a theater? Okay, so are you going to have mostly majors or not? Okay. Okay, so think about that, right? Is there a difference between how you teach to majors versus non-majors? And if you have a lot of non-majors, maybe you want to recruit them. Maybe you're hoping that they stay in your department. But you might also be able to assume a different level of knowledge. Right? If you're teaching anatomy and you have mostly pre-med students, is that going to be different than if you have people who are taking it just as a math and science course that they have to knock out of the gen ed or the core curriculum? Think about who your students are and how you're going to pitch that class. So what are their backgrounds and prior levels of knowledge? What resources do you have to help you? You've got your textbooks. You've got almost all textbooks have great teaching resource sites. You've got other faculty members. You might want to be showing particular media events, but I cannot encourage you enough. And I love using YouTube clips. I love using movies. I talk about relational and family, some great examples. You may have students who need things closed captioning that you don't even know about. So be careful when you use media that they are fully accessible and make sure that you don't, like, you know, if you just like randomly say, oh, I'm going to pull up something, make sure that you have thought about it ahead of time and thought about getting it closed captioned, and we can do that right here on campus, you just have to ask your department chair where you go to have that done, and the turnaround is pretty quick. You know, but if you're going to use mediated resources or things like that, make sure they're accessible to everyone in your class. Think about your course content, and if you walk away from here knowing nothing else, walk away knowing this. The bottom piece, if you don't know what's important enough for the students to tell, uh, or to know when they walk away from class, and the best you can say is you have to know this because it's on your test, you have failed them as a teacher. You have failed them as a teacher. You need to know what you want your students to walk away from your class knowing. What are the most important things? Have you ever been in a class where the teacher will talk about things for like hours and then none of that will be on the test and everything is from the textbook? Why do you think that happens? Yeah, they don't know how to test you on what they're teaching, and they're probably just using a test bank, and they're writing the test the night before using the same test they've used for 20 years, and they are failing their students when they do that. You need to know what it is you expect your students to know, what is most important, and how you're going to test them on that. And one of the things that I do is I always kind of write my test at the beginning of the semester based on my PowerPoint, so what I think I'm going to cover, and after every class or at the end of every week, I go back and say, did I cover this information? Or, wow, we had that awesome discussion in class today. I want to make sure I add that to my test. And I am constantly evaluating my exams based on what we're learning at that time. And my test should be the majority of what they need to know. Now, you might be teaching in a subject where they need to know every little detail and every single thing in the textbook. But then you need to tell them, pay attention to these things even if I'm not covering them. Because it's not a good pedagogical technique to test people over stuff that they never saw coming. And saying, well, it was in the textbook. How did you not know? Okay, you can pull that. I know it's going to stop you from pulling that. Would you have liked that when it was done to you? No. So, you know, think about how you can help them learn. And then finally, um, putting it all together. Visit your class before you teach that class. So go in today. Go into that classroom next week before classes start. Make sure that the podium is something you have access to. I always teach in Reese Pfeiffer Hall, and I had to go teach in the College of Business. They've got a different password on their computer. I couldn't get into it. So I had to go get the business password to use on that computer. If I had waited until the first day of class to go check out that equipment, we would have lost 15 minutes of the first day of class, and I would have looked like a day back. Okay? Um, bring your own markers with you. There are some rooms, but they have legs and walk off if you need them. Know if you're going to distribute, distribute your syllabus on Blackboard Learn or on paper. And then, be prepared like we talked about with your introduction. 
Put the information on the whiteboard, especially your name. As juvenile as it sounds, make them repeat your name. I am Mr. Green. Everybody say it with me. I am Mr. Green. And if I don't make people say, I am Dr. Mills, several times, when they want to get a hold of me, they go to the department office and say, I need to talk to my instructor for relational communication. And they'll go, who is it? They'll go, well, you know, like the one who kind of looks like a mom, and she has red hair, and she's kind of chubby, and she talks really fast. I don't want them having to describe me when they go to look for me. Make them repeat your name, right? And you don't want them going like, yeah, you know, you know, the young guy with glasses and tall. Make them learn your name. Get them involved in some kind of icebreaker, but please make sure you're sensitive when you choose your icebreakers. I'm an introvert. I'm an extrovert. You cannot embarrass me. There's nothing that I could do to be embarrassed, right? I I've always been like that. You know, truth or dare, I'm taking a dare every time. You know, I have a child with Down syndrome, and, you know, like, there's just nothing you can do to embarrass me. I'm over it. Okay? My oldest son, who is 16, is an introvert. He's hoping to come here in a couple of years and study, study computer engineering. He has high levels of anxiety, and if you put him on the spot with an embarrassing question, he'll freeze. So even if you say, you know, like this is kind of a fun icebreaker, do you, you know, roll your toilet paper, wad it up before you use it? That's going to make him uncomfortable. Most of us will go, that's kind of funny. It'll make him uncomfortable. So think about icebreakers that don't have the potential to make people who are already introverts uncomfortable, but get to know their names. Go to your photo rosters and look at their pictures before they come in. Right? Know what they look like, have a sense of who they are. And then do a content introduction that first day of class. How many of you have ever been to a class, they give you the syllabus, they go over it, and then you leave? Do not do that. Go over the syllabus, do an icebreaker, or even take the icebreaker to the second class. Sometimes I'll take the icebreaker to the second class while I blow off the first one, which drives me crazy, but they do it. Begin with a content introduction. If I'm teaching family communication, I begin with the history of family communication, how it's part of our discipline. If I'm teaching research methods, I talk about what is knowledge and how social science differs from the arts and humanities. But start with a content introduction. Why? Why do we want to start with content introduction? Exactly. To give them a sense of the class. A, so they know how that you teach, and B, whether or not they even want to be in there. Students, class shop. They sign up for two or three classes extra, knowing they're going to drop one or two of them. So, give them a content introduction so that they can decide if they actually want to be there in there with you. And then if they're leaving, stand at the door, say goodbye to them, thank them, invite them to your office hours. Get involved with your students so that they know that if they don't show up, you might actually remember. Okay, so find some way to connect with them. And then just stop kind of just on your little handout there. Seek out mentors and guidance. We can't teach you everything in 50 minutes, especially when I'm talking this quickly. So seek out people who can help you. Find mentors, find other people in the same boat. Make friends with people in here. Some of my best teaching buddies are in our sciences, not in communication. But we share the same kinds of issues. Stay organized, stay organized, stay organized. And remember to balance your roles. You guys are student teachers just like there are student athletes. And you guys have all heard the controversy where people are really annoyed when athletes focus more on their athletes than their student part, right? You guys have the same kind of balance. You need to be good, solid teachers. But if you are teaching so intently and you are spending so much time with your students and with your materials that your own classwork and research is suffering or your families are suffering or you put your workout routines, you are failing at balance. And you have got to remember to stay balanced. You need to be a good teacher. You don't need to be a great teacher right now. You need to be a great student. You need to be an amazing parent or a wonderful partner. You need to be a good teacher. The university does not expect you to put this first. Now, if you're a crappy teacher, you're going to lose your assistantship. <laughs> right? So don't, don't pull it. Oh, I can skip half my classes and never be in my office hours. But organize, stay up front, do your responsibilities, do them well, but don't get unbalanced. 
Finally, you know, don't lose your cool. If a student challenges you in class, what do you do? Yes, be careful of getting hostile and defensive. Just say, well, you have a great point. Why don't we continue that after class? Or I can see, you know, a student goes, well, that's not what Dr. So-and-so taught me. Go, wow, you seem really passionate about that. Why don't you stay after class and we'll follow up with that. Okay? Don't engage a student who wants to fight with you in front of everybody else. Because who's going to lose when you do that? You are. And you will find a student every once in a while who will do that. And if you mess up, it then you mess up, right? Accept your mistake. You go, hey, I'm in syllabus. It looks like I had Wednesday twice. Here's how we're going to change it. Don't overly apologize, but accept it and move on. And if a student puts you on the spot, say, let me think about that. If everybody in your class all of a sudden wants to change the date of the exam, and they all put you on the spot and say, can we move the exam till Thursday? Don't feel bullied at that moment and go, well, everybody wants to. Yes, we can change it. Say, hey, let me think about that. Because it's possible that everybody else has been prepared, and I'd like to talk about with favoritism, right? We, we, if everybody else, if one person is prepared, and that was on the syllabus, you'd be messing up one student who's so prepared, right? And then enjoy yourself, guys. Teaching can be fun, so take it until you become it, right? Enjoy it, because if you look like you're miserable and you walk in and say, I have to do this for my internship, you're going to have a miserable semester, okay? So thank you all very much, and head off to either wherever you're going. Thank you.